One author and professional moderator makes a living telling groups of listeners that the sky is blue, water is wet, and yes, racism is a reality. A somewhat novel idea, she crafts her conversation with white, not black people in mind. She addresses the subject of oppression to the group of people consciously and subconsciously oppressing, and the result earns her a side eye from every side involved. The author, Robin D'Angelo. The book, White Fragility. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's Let's get lit. Hi, readers. This is Kari. And this is Alexis. And you're listening to Lit Society, a show about books and drama. Alexis, drama. how are you doing today? Oh, yeah, I'm doing okay. A little tired. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm, working. Uh, kind of busy right now, but now, yeah, what's up tired. with you? Because I thought this was like a low season for your job. You know what? You fooled Since me. Since we're still in the um, pandemic, my work has still increased. And I actually was put on a project that I don't usually handle at this time. So that um, increased my workload a little okay. bit. Okay. So, so they recognized yeah. your competency and gave you more work, but you salary. So you don't give no more pay. <laughs> <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, you How are good. you, Kari? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. You know, I can't complain. I've been really lazy lately, so I'm trying to get out of that, trying to be more active and have a, you know, I don't know, resemblance to health. Uh, so when outside open back up, I'm ready. Well, aren't you running still? <laughs> Once, twice a week. That's good. I mean, so that... <laughs> Every bit counts, right? And now yeah, we need some <laughs> regularity. Okay, so now it's time for Society Says. And this is the portion, readers, of the show where we share your comments with the rest of our Lit Society. Alexis, is there a comment you thought particularly lit that you'd love to share? Indeed, indeed I did. You know, this comment actually comes from a review of our Dr. Jekyll's Apothecary Candle. What? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. From our List Society Pie Shop. So I'd like to share Gabriella's um, um, review of that candle. She says, smells like the cast of Takers. You know the movie, right? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the candle smells like what I imagine Idris Elba must smell like. I can't really smell the leather, but Definitely wood and patchouli. It's very fragrant and smooth. I love it. Okay. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank Readers, you. If you haven't had an opportunity, give our Lytle Teas a try. And particularly Dr. Jekyll's Apothecary because that's a favorite of mine. Yeah, mine too. So Lytle Teas are custom candles that I make in our dining room and pour by hand. So um, they're very personal to us. And we love those candles. Yep, if you'd like yep. some handcrafted candles that smell better than anything you've ever smelled, please visit our store. Like Idris. Uh, Idris. <laughs> Shop that. Lit Society. Or what is it? LitSocietyPodShop.com. And it's <laughs> hilarious because I know some people who watch Takers on mute. I'm looking at them, but that ain't none of my business. So anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, what time kind of did you find lit this I'm week? Okay. So this comes from Apple Podcasts and it's from Sam Malicious. They say they stumbled upon our show basically by accident and fell in love. They love listening to us too. They have um, been in stitches because of our foolishness <laughs> and got a lot of takeaways. Uh, for example, putting salt on salad. Who knew how much a difference it made? A difference. The, like right. Really. Mm-hmm. Sam Malicious says their husband was like, why does salad taste so good? <laughs> ah, it's the salt. <laughs> Just a little bit. Mm hmm. Uh, they go on to recommend a book for us um, that's being made into a movie. It's based in Oklahoma. Oh. So, um, yeah, that's really interesting. We'll take a look at that. So that is from Sam Randall. Thank you so much. They go Thank by you. Sam Malicious. Thank you so Thank much you. for your review on Apple Podcasts. Listeners, please remember if you like to share your thoughts with us about the show, bad or good, you know, we're open to constructive criticism too. Please uh, leave us a comment on social media, email us. And we especially love when you leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts along with with a comment about why you love us. We love you too. And we might share your comment on the show. 
All right. So moving on. Now it's time for our theme of the week, but I thought we could try something different. We'll have a uh, open discussion, no theme Ooh, okay. this week. And I want to um, bite into, as you dive into the content, content, of the book. Content, mm-hmm. Yeah. As you dive into the content of the book after that, I'd like to have a discussion about the discussions going on around the book. Good. I, pre- I prepare for that. I, I, um, I, I got some of that too. I was going to incorporate it, but I love that we could include it. Okay, cool. Well, let's take a break before we get into the um, deep dive of white fragility. <laughs> Can you give us some background on our author, Robin D'Angelo, and perhaps her inspiration for white fragility? Okay, so um, Robin D'Angelo has a PhD in multicultural education from the University of Washington. Um, She has tenure at Westfield State University in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. She is affiliate (laughs) associate professor of education at the University of Washington. She has two honorary doctorate degrees. Her area of research is in whiteness studies and critical discourse analysis. She traces how whiteness is reproduced in everyday narratives. Robin has a couple of student choice awards for educator of the year at the University of Washington School of Social Work. She has a number, uh, numerous amount of publications and book, and she's received book awards. Robin coined the term white fragility in 2011 in an academic article, which influenced the international dialogue on race. The article is the basis for this book. The book that we're reviewing today, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Real. Racism was released in June of 2018 and debuted on the New York Times bestseller list where it remained for 85 weeks. It is currently being translated into five languages. There was renewed interest in this book after the death of George Floyd. Professionally, she's a consultant, an educator, a facilitator, and she's done that for over 20 years on issues of race and social justice. Um, She's worked with a wide range of organizations, including private, nonprofit and governmental. She provides keynote presentations on whiteness, white fragility, race relations and racial justice. Uh, Kari, do you have anything you want to add about our author? I have a couple of things. You touched on one major point um, and the rest I'll save for after your um, dive. So if you could give us a brief synopsis without spoilers of white fragility. Okay. All right. So Robin D'Angelo expands her original article on white fragility into a book that speaks directly to white people and hopes that they buy in or else be perceived as racist. This book defines white fragility, how race shapes the lives of white people, how white fragility protects racial equality and what can be done about it. Kari, Mm -hmm. who do you think would enjoy reading this book? Um, Anyone that's truly... uh maybe in the process of educating themselves on, we've said this before, racial hierarchy, um, not where it comes from though. In this case, it's about its effects and perhaps how to navigate it or be a um, force for good within it, within society. <clears throat> um, I hope that makes sense. What about you, Alexis? Uh, what, what were your first thoughts about white fragility about this book? You know, I saw this book at um, a White Plains, New York airport in November of 2019. And I like, wow, that's a really interesting title. And so I wanted to read it. It was it had been on. So it's been on my list for a while. And at the time that I saw it at the airport, I was unfamiliar with the term white fragility. So just finally put that out, um, put it on that list. And so we can dive into it. Yeah, the title is very grabbing. Yeah. You know, by Mm -hmm. design. So, okay. All right, cool. Well, now it's time for our deep dive, a spoiler filled deep dive into white fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Alexis, the floor is yours. Okay, so um, we're I'm going to kind of do what I did last time with um, stamped book, kind of dig into the book a little bit and then jump out with some questions so that we can kind of discuss it together. Okay, sounds good. Okay. First question. 
Kari, have you ever um, been in a position to... You said the questions was coming at the end. Go ahead. <laughs> they are, but I'm going to start with one, <laughs> a simple one. <laughs> have you ever uh, caught out a white person uh, for being racist? Uh, for saying something that I perceived as racist, and that's how I structured that conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't. Um, what was the response like? Positive. Uh, I, you know, uh, this person I know... Um, and I know a little about their background in this specific situation I'm thinking of because I'm sure it's happened more than once. Um, and because uh, this isn't, this is something that I don't know if they intended the meaning of what they said to be trans, to be received the way I received it. I let them know how I received it and why and um, what specifically they said that could be not problematic, but racist, straight up racist. And it was received well. Um, it's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's I mean, I think it. I don't know what they said when they got home, but when we was together, <laughs> they was like, "No, nah, that's cool. That makes sense." Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Like, mm-hmm. uh-huh. This is a teachable moment. <laughs> Part <laughs> one. Okay. To begin, when people arrived on what we call America today, they were escaping religious persecution. The way they started to form their new society was theft of land and attempted genocide of indigenous people. Then to build their new society, they kidnapped and enslaved Africans and their descendants. White men were in power. Women couldn't vote until 1920 and black women weren't allowed to vote until 1965. Yet America is a country founded on the principle that all people were created equal. Who were they referring to? Side note, the document was created by white men who many of which held slaves. So let's start with identity politics. This term refers to the focus on barriers specific groups face in their struggle for equality. Now, as I understand it, to talk about identity politics, we have to talk about the oppressed and the oppressor. For example, women couldn't vote and white men had the power to allow them to vote. Robin says that this book is rooted in identity politics. Robin is white and is addressing a common white dynamic. She says she is writing to a mainly white audience. So when she uses we or us, she's referring to white people. Now I may say that, but I'm not talking about me as a black person. Okay. (laughs) Wait, what do you mean? (laughs) You're saying that these are her words, not yours. You're not addressing white people. She is within her book. Yes, but I may say we or her as I'm retelling the story. So let's remember, not talking about me as a black person. Now, (laughs) she says this book may hit hard because whites don't tend to think of themselves in racial terms. And she says as an insider, she is using her position to challenge racism. Robin says that people who do not identify as white may also find this book helpful for understanding why it's often difficult to talk to white people about racism. She hopes this book affirms the cross-racial experience of people of color and provides useful insight. As with the beginning, this book looks at the U.S. and the general context of the West, including Canada and Europe. It does not address the nuances and variations within other social political settings, although similar patterns are observed elsewhere. So Robin describes a scenario where she and a black woman are in a room standing before a group of mostly white people at their place of employment. The room is filled with tension and charged with hostility. It's a group of 40 employees in the room. 38 are white. She's just presented the definition of racism, and it includes the acknowledgement that whites hold social and institutional power over people of color. In response, a white man has pounded his fist on the table and yells, a white person can't get a job anymore. Robin wonders several things. Why is this white man so angry? Why is he being so careless about the impact of his anger? Why doesn't he notice the effect his outburst is having on the few people of color in the room? Why are all the white people either sitting in silent agreement with him or tuning out? All she did was give the definition of racism. 
White people in North America live in a society that is deeply saturated and, un- excuse me, deeply separate and unequal by race. And white people are the beneficiaries of that separation and inequality. So because white people seldom experience racial discomfort in this society in which they dominate, they haven't had to build up racial stamina. So they don't have tough skin when it comes to racism. And we so, talked about that a little in the, um, the warmth of other sons because black people have to be around uh, white people because that's the um, majority in some societies. We learn about other cultures, whereas mm-hmm. a white person that is encapsulized within a white neighborhood that goes to a predominantly white school and works a job at a predominantly white culture uh, company, they never really have to uh, have to doesn't mean they can't, but they don't have to um, uh, ingratiate themselves with, you know, people of different races or right. learn about other people's cultures. Right, right. So when racial topics arise in conversations, white people become highly fragile. So what does this fragility look like? It feels like a challenge to their identity as good and moral people. Thereby, um, they perceive any attempt to connect them with this system of racism as unsettling and unfair moral offense. Even the smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. The suggestion that being white has meaning triggers a range of defensive responses, such as anger, grief, guilt, becoming argumentative, silence, a desire to withdraw from the situation. The responses reinstate white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return their racial comfort and maintain their dominance within the racial hierarchy. Dear readers, It's what this is what Robin D'Angelo coined as white fragility. So although it triggers discomfort and anxiety, Robin says it's born of superiority and entitlement. Robin says white fragility is not a weakness per se. In fact, it is a powerful means of white racial control and the protection of white advantage. Now, back in the day, When she was a diversity trainer, she was taken aback at how angry and defensive so many white people became at the suggestion that they were connected to racism in any way. The idea that they would be required to attend a workshop on racism outraged them. They would come to this training already angry, mad that that they even had to be there (laughs) because racism is a problem of bad people. And if you're not bad, you can't be racist is the thinking. And so they would demonstrate this by um, slamming down their notebooks and arguing all the points. Essentially, it appeared that they were close to a discussion about racism. So she found this interaction perplexing because there were either few or no people of color in the workplace. So for that reason, she would assume they would appreciate an educational workshop on racism. Well, initially, Robin was intimidated by these reject reactions and it held her back from um, it, it kind of held her back from responding. And eventually she saw what was underneath these interactions or these reactions. And she saw responses that were consistent from a variety of participants. For example, white suburbanites who had no sustained relationship with people of color were certain they held no racial prejudice or animosity. Others reduced racism to a matter of nice people versus mean people. And most believe that racism ended in 1865 with the end of slavery. What she saw was a refusal to <laughs> That's acknowledge. Hilarious. I'm sorry to say that one more time. The Did you say time? most people thought that racism ended with slavery? Yeah, most in believed. Her, her, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, this kind of goes back to just an ignorance about the country, about our history as Americans, because I don't know how you can understand Jim Crow, civil rights movement, or even um, a civil unrest of today and think that racism ended with slavery or well, Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah. Tired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, The responses have become so predictable, she said, consistent, reliable, that she stopped taking resistant. um, She stopped taking um, um, personal 
she stopped taking that resistance personal and she could get past her own conflict avoidance and reflect on what was behind it. So she dug deeper and through her experiences that she could see that people believe that only bad people were racist as well as how individualism allowed white people to exempt themselves from the forces of socialization. Now, white people are taught to think about racism as discrete acts committed by individual people rather than this complex interconnected system. Because she saw so many white expressions of resentment towards people of color, she realized the following. White people see themselves as entitled to, deserving of, more than people of color deserve. White people are invested in a system that serves them and how hard whites work to deny it. She saw how defensive they became when the dynamics were named. This defensiveness maintained the racial status quo. So if you're listening to Alexis um, as a white listener, perhaps, and that was triggering or felt like uh, if you're thinking, but I am not a racist individual then what Alexis is saying and gleaning from the book is that that thinking is the problem (laughs) because racism is inflicted on people. People are oppressed by societal norms and organizations and systems. Mm -hmm. So you individually may not be acting in a racist way on a daily basis, um, but society is conditioning you and that society is conditioning you to believe you are better. If you are poor and white, at least you're not black. There is a hierarchy that you still benefit from. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their problems, be it economical or whatever otherwise. But this is specifically about the race problem. And the race problem puts black people in this country on the bottom and it brings up everyone else. And that becomes like that, that translates into real life effects on real life people every day. So you as an individual, sorry, no, go ahead. You as an individual may be good. That don't stop that you're benefiting from the from the structure you didn't create, right? But you still benefit from, and you have to think: Well, am I subconsciously protecting the system that benefits me? Mm -hmm. Subconsciously, yeah, as Um, a good person. So it kind of goes also back. um, That same idea is what we talked about in Stamp. It's the policies that are in place that create this um, this racism policies, okay? So Robin, when she had identified this, she could then reflect on her own racism more cl- critically. If she believed that only bad people who intended to hurt others because of race could do so, of course she would respond with outrage at right. any suggestion that she was involved in racism. Thus, you made a good point. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. You made a good point that um, it's the policies that inflict racism. And if you're thinking, well, racism exists even without policies, then understand that um, race race was used to justify race. Racism is the father, not the, the, the child. Okay. So racism was first uh, because money was involved. And then race or this uh, social construct of race was created to justify racism. So those policies are like grandchildren of that father of racism. So they're all connected. Ooh, it's a lot to think about. So Robin says that the way racism is defined, it makes it impossible for white people to understand it. She says, given white people's racial isolation coupled with misinformation, any suggestion that they're complicit in racism is unwelcome and a insulting shock to their system. If, however, she understands racism as a system into which she socialized, she can receive feedback on um, problematic racial pat- patterns as a helpful way to support learning and growth. She says it's not personal. Right. Yeah. She says None of the white peoples whose actions in this book that she describes would identify themselves as racist, but as racially progressive. And so this book is intended for white progressives. White progressives, she believes, cause the most daily damage to people of color. They are (laughs) any white person who thinks they are not racist, less racist, or think they already get it. This book is not intended to prove the existence of racism or provide a solution, but to make it visible how white fragility keeps racism in place. 
Part two, narrowing the issues of white fragility and broadening the understanding of racism. White people are not taught to see themselves in racial terms or draw attention to the race or behave as if it mattered. When race does matter, it's not their race. It's always somebody else's. Robin believes to stop being triggered by seeing whiteness in racial terms, we, they gotta face that challenge. Name their race. I'm white. I got white benefits. Number one, uninformed opinions about race. Okay, she said she could be seen as qualified to lead a major or minor organization in this country without understanding the perspective of experiences of people of color, nor any ability to engage critically with the topic of race. She talked about graduate school, law school, teacher education. She says none of those things, none of those um, schools discuss racism. Now, there is criticism of that thought, and we will get into it later. But if they consider themselves as progressive, they might have required a diversity course. In the course, they're likely to read about ethnic authors or learn about heroes and heroines from various groups of color, but no guarantee that racism is discussed in this schooling. So interrupting the forces of racism, racism is a necessary ongoing thing. It's a lifelong work because the forces that are conditioning this racist framework are always at play. Then she talks about socialism. Okay. Socialization. That's individualism says that we each unique, we are each unique and we stand apart from others even those within social groups. So according to individualism, race is irrelevant. Robin gives the example of Bill Gates' son being born into a set of opportunities that benefit him throughout life, whether he is mediocre or exceptional. Even though he has this unearned advantage, whites cling tightly to the ideology of individual individualism um, when asked to consider their own unearned advantages so regardless right, that means that you receive advantages because you worked hard enough and have the skill set um, necessary to achieve them and someone who doesn't have it hasn't worked hard enough and in some other way doesn't deserve them mm-hmm. so regardless of this idea that social groups don't matter and that we all are equal we know that man is different from woman rich from poor able-bodied from disabled um and you want to be more one more than the other, maybe not a woman versus a man. But right. You don't want to if it's the choices are poor versus rich. You want to be you want to be rich. <laughs> you want to be able. Body. So you understand that there is a difference. And it's the same with white or black. Which would you like to be? What would you what would you prefer to be? And the answer that you might not want to face is your social conditioning from society. Racism was or white privilege was created to help poor white people mm-hmm. um, feel entitled to oppress black people and at least uh, be distracted with that so that they don't look to the elite and start attacking them. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it was like the elite's way to give poor white people something to do. Mm -hmm. Here's some privilege. You can slap black people around, but black people cannot defend themselves for fear of death. Yeah. And that's continued in other ways. Yep. And so we come to understand who we are by understanding who we're not. So objectivity tells us that it's possible to be free of all bias. Okay. Whites need to challenge group identity. If group membership is relevant, then whites don't see the world from the universal perspective, but from the perspective of a specific kind of human. But to reflect on racial frames is difficult because we are taught that to have a racial viewpoint is to be biased. If there is a denial, then there is no need to examine or change these views. Yeah, stop talking about race and it'll go away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this book generalizes and Robin assumes to know things about people just because she's white and they white. They come from the same background, so it's okay. Whether Mm. you're poor, you endure struggle, (laughs) or et cetera, there are exceptions. And she gives an example of representing, of presenting to a group of 200 employees with no more than five people of color, two of them being black. 
During the presentation, she mentioned the importance of having racial humility and not exempting themselves from the unavoidable dynamics of racism. After she finished speaking, a line of white people formed um, to reiterate the same opinions on race that they held when they entered the room. The first was an Italian American who explained that he they were once considered black and were discriminated against. So didn't she think white people experience racism too? Robin says the idea that he could exempt himself from an examination of his own whiteness because Italians were once discriminated against is a common example of individualism. So just to illustrate uh, his point, let's say that um, there are 200 people in a company and um, 150 of them, and I hope this isn't trigger, triggering, um, get cancer. That company should probably meet together to discuss, well, what environment are we creating? What What's around us? What's going on where mm-hmm. all these people got the same disease? Let's say they did that and they had a meeting to talk about the way cancer is spreading through the company. And someone stands up and says, well, I got a cold. <laughs> so there are more sicknesses than just cancer. And a cold that gets bad enough can cause heart problems that can cause death, which is the same result as um, most cancers. So don't you think other diseases exist don't you (laughs) no why are we still talking about the cancer (laughs) we're talking about the cancer one because this particular meeting was arranged and created to talk about cancer Mm -hmm. so that's why if we if we have a meeting to talk about the cold then you'll be invited first in line (laughs) and we'll have you speak actually okay and and second (laughs) it seems that cancer is threatening the lives of more people than the cold just ratio wise so let's discuss that first yeah that's okay yeah i think that might be a little and that person goes no i don't have it so i don't want to talk about it i want to talk about the cold yeah yeah well you know so that's that Robin said a better way. And if you think that illustration was poorly created, I just want to say Robin didn't make it. I just made it just now. So maybe it is. (laughs) Robin (laughs) and Stay said it would have been more engaging if he would have considered how Italian Americans were able to become white and how that assimilation has shaped his experiences in the present as a white man. I like that she brought out how, yes, you, you be, you you on paper became white. Another example um, are Armenians who want a court case to be determined as white. That That is documented evidence that you had to become white in this system that allowed for you to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Robin says as a sociologist, she is comfortable generalizing because social life is patterned and predictable in measurable ways. Robin says, while you may have some differences Say you grew up in poverty, maybe you're Ashkenazi Jew with European heritage, or you grew up in Canada or Hawaii or Germany, or even had people of color in your family. None of those situations exempt white people from the forces of racism. Instead, Robin suggests this question. I am white and I have had X experience. How did X shape me as a result of also being white? She says, setting aside your uniqueness is critical to you seeing the big picture. So let go of your individual narrative and grapple with the collective, the collective messages members of a larger shared culture are experiencing and then work to see how the messages have shaped your life rather than use some aspect of your story to excuse yourself from that impact. She also says that it's important to have a broader view of racism. Drop the post-civil rights um, era thoughts about racism, that racists are mean people who intentionally dislike others because of their race. Races are immoral. She said, drop all of that. She says that if your definition of racist is someone who holds conscious dislike of people because of race, then you are against racism and are not a racist. However, she's not using that definition white people need to get uncomfortable and learn what to do with that discomfort. Uh, She offers a series of questions. Why does this unsettle me? What would it mean for me if this were true? How does this lens change my understanding of racial dynamics? How can my unease help reveal the unexamined assumptions I have been making? Is it possible that because I am white, 
there are some racial dynamics that I cannot see. Am I willing to consider that possibility? If not, why not? Well, let's talk about race as a social construct. We talked about this a bit um, in our coverage of the book stamp by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi. That was a couple weeks ago. It started with Zurara, the Portuguese storyteller, remember him? And even yes. um, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher who believed Greeks were better than everyone. All those counts, accounts were preserved. And at one point, passed on down the line, it's stuff that people could hold on to and use for future reference. One day, a Frenchman asked Thomas Jefferson a question. And when Thomas Jefferson responded to the question, he put pen to paper and wrote the notes on the state of Virginia. And even though <laughs> um, that French person printed and shared that information with the world without his knowledge, he expressed Thomas Jefferson expressed his true feelings about black people, namely that they were inferior in nature. And this idea of racial dif difference became commonly accepted scientific fact. It was created to justify unequal treatment. So, yeah, people wanted to be able to still actual living humans and have them work for free. So they created racism in order to have racism. They needed to create race. By the time Thomas Jefferson came, he said, well, let's also try to find some biological reason why black people are different and subhuman to justify the racism and the race. And doctors were like, sure. Mm -hmm. That sounds <laughs> yeah. good to us. So mm -hmm. uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who was an author, he said. He is. <laughs> <laughs> he made the comment that you always finding the indie artist I love it now who is this Tanahasi go ahead Tanahasi Coates I gotta look him up yes indeed he is an author uh, he made the statement that Kari mentioned earlier and that is race is the child of racism not the father exploitation of resources came first then the ideology of unequal races to justify the exploitation that followed now, so I done plagiarized Tanahasi by accident, and he said it way better than me. <laughs> Typical. That's why I'm scared to write. Yeah, no. Go ahead. <laughs> Ibram, Kendi, I mentioned before, he's a historian and the author of the book Stamped, um, said, if we truly believe that all humans are equal, then disparity and condition can only be a result of systemic discrimination. Again, that takes us back to the policies that were put in place. So you can't believe all humans are equal and also believe that black people are in the situation they're in in this country because of some fault of them, mm -hmm. that it's all on them. Now, you can't believe that every individual is responsible for their own actions, mm -hmm. but, you, but you can't believe that all the problems faced by uh, black people as a whole are because of their own uh, actions or lack thereof. So the term white first appeared in colonial law in late 1600s. By 1790, people were asked to claim race on the census. And by 1825, the perceived degrees of blood determined who would be classified as Indian. From the late 1800s through the early 20th century, as waves of immigrants entered the U.S., the concept of the concept of white race was solidified. When slavery in the U.S. was abolished in 1865, whiteness remained profoundly important as legalized racist, racist exclusion and violence against blacks continued in new forms. To have citizenship and its rights, you had to be classified as what? White. So people with non-white racial classifications began to petition the courts to be classified. Now the courts had the power to say, who was white and who wasn't. And as Kari referenced before, Armenians, they stood in line and said, reclassify us, reclassify us. And the courts did so. They were scientifically classified as Caucasian. Also who jumped in line, the Japanese. They were, however, they were not given the Cauc Caucasian classification. They were classified as Mongoloid. However, Asian Indians were not legally white, but were classified scientifically as Caucasian. And this was all within the courts to 
um, do so. And to justify these contradictory rulings, the court stated that being white was based on the common understanding of the white man. So if they thought you was white, if a white man thought you was white, then you could be counted as white. Mm -hmm. Since race is a social construct, who was included in the category of whiteness um, changes over time. So while European um, ethnic groups such as the Irish, Italians, and Polish, um, we talked about the Italian American earlier, were originally excluded from white classification, eventually through assimilation, they begin to receive official status as white. And that assimilation, that assimilation meant eating American foods, discarding, discarding customs that set them apart. Now, through class, poor and working class people were not always perceived as fully white, but they were eventually given the status of whiteness, of course, to exploit labor. We talked about this before. If poor whites were focused on feeling superior to those below them in status, they were less focused on those above them. Um, Again, we talked about that last week. Privilege was introduced to distract poor whites and give them something to be superior to. Robin said that although working class whites experience classism, they aren't also experiencing racism. And you can um, get out of your class, Mm -hmm. at least in this country. You can get out of your economic standing. But if you are black, you will always be black. Mm -hmm. And also congratulations. (laughs) Robin says she grew up in poverty and felt a deep sense of shame about being poor, but she also knew that she was white and it was better to be white. Now, let's talk about prejudice. Do we have to? Yeah, yeah. And we actually had a conversation about this not too long ago. Um, Prejudice is prejudgment about another person based on the social groups um, to which that person belong. It includes thoughts, feelings and other stereotypes, attitudes and generalizations that are based on little or no experience that are projected on everyone from that group. Prejudices are shred because we swim in the same cultural water and absorb the same messages. So because in our group, we're hearing that same message, we're all going to have um, prejudices. We gain information about social groups from the society in which we function in. And that information helps to um, make sense of the group um, for your cultural framework. And people who claim that they are not prejudiced demonstrate a lack of self-awareness. Because we all have prejudices. Discrimination is an action based on prejudice. Discrimination includes ignoring, exclusion, threats, uh, ridicule, slander, and violence. Robin says everyone has prejudice and everyone discriminates. So inserting a reverse doesn't make sense. There's a professor of American studies uh, um, and anthropology at a university, and he said racism is a structure, not an event. And they gave an example of the American woman's struggle for suffrage, that voting rights, um, as an illustration of how institutional power transforms prejudice and discrimination into structures of oppression. Structures of oppression go well beyond the individual. So while women could be prejudiced and discriminate against men in individual interactions, women as a group cannot deny men their civil rights. But men as a group could and did deny women their civil rights. Men could do so because they controlled all the institutions. The only way women could gain such fridge was for white men to grant it to them. Women could not grant suffrage for themselves. Racism occurs when a racial group's prejudice is backed by legal authority and institutional control. Racism is a system. People of color may also hold prejudices and discriminate against white people, but they lack the social and institutional power that transforms their prejudice and discrimination into racism. The impact of their prejudice on whites is temporary and contextual. Whites hold the social and institutional positions in society to infuse their racial prejudice into laws, policies, practices, and norms of society in a way that people of color do not or cannot. Um, The example we were given is if, um, and we discussed this a couple of weeks ago, if a black person owns a company and decides he wants to hire only black people, you remember that conversation? And, um, oh yes, of course. And while 
that may demonstrate discrimination, people of color cannot pass legislation that prohibits white people or everybody like them from getting hired. So so from advancing in society. So the talk is that black people can't be racist. I yes. don't mean you can't be prejudiced or that you can't be biased. But um, and I understand it now more clearly because racism um, is a social construct from which race comes from. Um, that construct was created by the society that black people are not a part of. Right. And so racism is a specific thought, action and overall um, like a system mm -hmm. an overall system. system. Mm -hmm. um, and Robin compares it to I don't know if she thought of this or um, found it somewhere. But if you get really close to a bird cage, oh, yeah, you may not see the um, like grates. You can only see the bird if you get really close. And then if you turn your head to the left, you might see one great. And then if you turn your head to the right, you might see one. Am I saying great? Is that right? Anyway, you know what I'm saying? Sure. The cage wires. <laughs> <laughs> so you get really close. You can see through the wires. If you turn to the left or right, you can only see one wire. So you might reason, why doesn't the bird just fly around the wires and be free? But if you back up, you see that all these wires are interconnecting um, to control where the bird can go, how they fly, and actually like what they eat and what they can do. That's all com controlled by these interconnecting wires. So it's not just a matter of going around one wire or whatever. Um, this is an entire system of wires of which the bird cannot be free. So people of color may have um, prejudices, but Robin says that this prejudice or discrimination against their own or other groups of color, it ultimately hurts them and it reinforces a system of racism that still benefits whites. Only whites have the collective social and institutional power and privilege over people of color. People of color do not have this power and privilege over white people. Now, while whites may be against racism, they still benefit from a system that privileges whites as the group. Um, a man named David Wellman summarizes racism as a system of advantage based on race. These advantages are referred to as white privilege, a sociological concept referring to the advantages that are taken for granted by whites and that cannot be similarly enjoyed by people of color in the same context. Example, government, community, workplace, schools, etc. Stating that racist, um, racism privileges whites does not mean that individual white people do not struggle or face barriers. It does not mean that. It means that we do not face the particular barrier of racism. Racism is a deeply embedded historical system of institutional power. It is not fluid and does not change simply um, because a few individuals of color manage to excel. And by focusing on the fact that this um, this racism has historical precedent and it's um, led to like a branch of uh, like a huge racism tree <laughs> from which there are many branches now. Um, then if you want to have a post-racial conversation, which a lot of people do, then you don't have to say, um, let's keep black people out of white neighborhoods. You can say, well, um, poorer children don't have the same in common with more with children that come from affluent homes. And so it really doesn't make sense to mix them together. That's a racist conversation without saying race. You can also um, have if you want to talk about um immigrants that are black, you can have a more xenophobic conversation by saying, well, we have to protect the interests of American workers as opposed to um, immigrant workers who, yeah, if they can earn their place among society can have um, certain rights, but we must first prioritize American workers. That American is a very loaded label. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. Americans of all different backgrounds mm -hmm. or whatever. It means a specific type of white American. Um, so that's the um, uh, racism now allows for these racial conversations that don't mention race. And I thought she explained that pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, she says that whiteness obscures racism by rendering whites, white privilege and racist institutions invisible. Um, for example, um, Jackie Robinson is celebrated as the first African-American to break the color line and play Major League Baseball. The, sub the subtext says that um, Jackie Robinson finally had what it took to play with the whites. But she says instead they should have said Jackie Robinson 
the first black man whites allowed to play in Major League Baseball. Right, because he didn't get into major leagues because he was the best black baseball player of all time. Whites control all major institutions of society and set the policies and practices that others must live by. Although rare individual people of color may be inside this circle of power, they support the status quo and do not challenge racism in any way significant enough to be threatening. And they still experience racism. For sociologists, white supremacy is a descriptive and useful term to capture the all-encompassing centrality and assumed superiority of people defined and perceived as white and the base, the practices based on that assumption. In this context, it doesn't refer to individual white people, their individual intentions or actions, but to an overarching political, economic, and social system of domination. The U.S. as a global power through movies, mass media, corporate culture, advertising, uh, U.S. owned manufacturing, military presence, historical colonial relations, missionary work, and other means, white supremacy is circulated globally. And this... Um, ideology promotes the idea of whiteness as the ideal for human for humanity um, well beyond the western world author of the book the racial contract uh, charles mills describes white supremacy supremacy as an unnamed political system that has made the modern world what it is today although white supremacy has shaped western political thought for hundreds of years it was never named. And in this way, white supremacy is rendered invisible while other political systems such as socialism, capitalism, fascism are identified and studied. White supremacy gets its power from being invisible and they take for granted aspects um, that underwrite all other political and social contracts. And so Mills makes two points that are critical to understanding white fragility. White supremacy is never acknowledged and we cannot study any socio-political system without addressing how that system is mediated by race. The failure to acknowledge white supremacy protects it from examination and holds it in place. OK, so Robin um, provided a list in a book of people who control our institution and the numbers um, are from 2016, 27. And I'll just name a few of them. She said U.S. Congress and um 2016, 2017 was 90% white. U.S. governors were 90%, 96% white. Um, U.S. House Freedom Caucus, 99% white. People who decide which TV shows we see, 93% white. What news is covered, 85% white. What music is produced, 95% white. And people who directed the 100 top grossing films of all time, 95% white. Teachers. 80% white. So that those numbers represent power and control by a racial group that is in the position to disseminate and protect its own self interest worldwide and interests across the entire society. So naming white supremacy changes the conversation by making the system visible and shifts the locus of change onto white people. That ends our discussion about um, the kind of review of the book. But let's get into some questions. You said you had some, Kari? Yeah, I wanted to um, address a conversation that's going on around this book. Uh, there are a few, um, but I specifically wanted to talk about. Um, so some <sighs> criticisms of the book. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, let's start there. Mm -hmm. So um, and let's begin with an illustration. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the Me Too movement, very popular um, in the last few years. But let's say a man writes a book about women's rights and um, about how men can better support women. He then tours the country talking about his book and it's met with praise and money. <laughs> and then um, Jeffrey Epstein and... Um, Fins and Harvey Weinstein is out it and this book that the man wrote becomes a bestseller again and he gets even more money and goes on another tour. Uh, meanwhile, the women, the subject of his discussion are excluded from the conversation or the income that the man is receiving. That is how this book is being um, talked about that uh, white people are still benefiting 
from Black Deaths and Black Pain. Uh, this book is addressing uh, white suppression or, or uh, black oppression from the view of a, a white person who seems to be sincerely trying to help the situation. Mm -hmm. um, but pe stepping back from that, people are like, yeah, but your book started as a bestseller mm -hmm. because it's easier to take the medicine when it comes from someone who looks like you. And then with George Floyd, um, Two years later, it became a bestseller again. Mm -hmm. And you're just getting all of this money because we're dying and being oppressed. And that's gross. Mm -hmm. And I get that. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Alexis, what are your thoughts on this book? Should it exist? <laughs> Should it have been written from a, by a white author um, who is then benefiting from, yeah, from what from a system that is and you know that's may not be her goal to benefit from racism but that's basically what what she's doing by this book existing what are your thoughts on that yeah and so um part of that conversation that i saw is that um the knowledge that she gained i think you said that in your scenario is was gained from black um people so um yeah and she um references um ibram x kendi um ta Coates and others and even others. in her daily life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But is it is it right for her to continue to earn uh, money? Well, they say she gives a percentage back, 15 percent. Should she even have to? Mm. Going back to the illustration of the man who writes a book about how men can better treat women. Um, we know that people are more likely to accept criticism when it comes from someone in their group. So um, if you are trying to address a majority white audience about racism, that message will be better received if it comes from a white speaker or author in this case. And so because of that, I think, yes, yeah, she should um, have written the book. This has been her study. As we read in her, um, the author bio, this has been her life study. So I think it's okay that she's written this book. Um, should she be making profiting what is it so 30, that's the thing. black people say don't kill me because my life matters and people are furious yeah <laughs> but a white woman writes woman writes a book saying recognize race of racism exists so that you don't become the type of person that would kill someone because of their race and she makes copious amounts of money. 30000 for speaker fees, I believe it's listed. As. Girl, and you know what? I'm all for it. Make your money. It's, we million. live in a capitalist but society, this, so. I mean, uh, that's that's icky. That is icky. Yeah. That's but what icky. is she supposed to do? And there we go. What's the alternative? Should she stay quiet? Should she... Um, choose to perhaps write a different book or what elevate <laughs> that, other books as th this time she's speaking to white people we want white people to hear the message right yeah and like I said um you know I'm addressing a specific conversation around this book perhaps uh, people have brought up good points as to why she shouldn't write it but I will say that personally I don't I'm done with the burden of responsibility <laughs> for introducing anti-racism -race, conversation and actions on other people that shouldn't be my burden to bear and, and so, that's what she <laughs> says in the book it's not your burden to bear and um, my thing is, are you at a loss of ways to learn? <laughs> there are books. There is the library. If you truly want to do the work and I put work in quotation marks because they don't take a lot mm -hmm. to learn about other people's experiences. What it takes is you being uncomfortable. Right. And that's what people don't want. So there's also a conversation um, from white writers and readers who feel like, why should the burden of responsibility for introducing anti-racist conversation come from me? Why should I be burdened with that if I'm not racist? Why do I have to speak up when a racist comment is made? Why do I have to feel uncomfortable? So that's triggering for people, right? Uh, what, she's, what she's saying, I believe, is that by denying that you could in some way be perpetuating racism, you are shutting your eyes to the truth of who you are, where you got to where you are, and why you think the way you do. And that's really something you need to personally address right. instead of shutting your eyes to right. it. You pick your battles. You pick your battle. I can say that me personally, this is not my ministry. It's not. I have other things that um, are important to me. Um, and this whole 
uh, anti-racist mission sounds exhausting. It is and exhausting. Just reading the books about it is exhausting. So I know it's exhausting to extend myself outside of this. It's exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting. But that doesn't mean that if I'm at a dinner table with my family and someone makes a racist comment about black people or about other groups that I can't speak up. You can at your table, at your dinner table. You most certainly can. I, I have a responsibility have a to do that. responsibility to not kiki along with that. If Alexis makes one of her many racist <laughs> jokes, I'm just kidding. But if she were to make her, I'm not going to use you specifically. If, uh, yeah, if Alexis makes a racist joke, it is my responsibility as a friend to say, hey, girl, that's not cool because of this, this and this. And, and here's the thing, the idea that you're making a, a joke about it and considering it, there's so much in this book, but the idea that you're making a, a joke about it, right? That in itself is, it leads to your mentality. It's not just a joke. It's it's something mm-hmm. you've thought about, right? Mm-hmm. And the idea that you repeat it puts some belief in that. So somebody needs to step up and say something to me since I'm saying that joke. I, I, I'm holding on to those feelings. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. So say something to me. So what does this book get right in your opinion? I um, Those descriptions of fragility, um, mm-hmm. I've seen them. So yeah. I like that. I um I appreciate that. But can we go back to one more thing? There is a um black man. Um his name is uh one John McWhorter. Uh, the linguist? Yep, the linguist mm-hmm. who um who criticizes her book. Yeah, I saw his piece in the Atlantic. Yeah, and he said that um it's condescending to black people. What are your comments on that? Um, I understand. I mean, I felt like he brought up some valid points. I I mean, he also to me sounds as if he's defending the uh, white people who read this and are offended. He felt like um, just because you don't speak up doesn't mean you're not racist. And context matters. I think in some cases, uh, just because you don't speak up doesn't mean you are racist. Um, and I think context matters if you have the ability to challenge someone's wrong thinking in a loving and not, you can um, express your, you can express to someone that they're wrong in their actions without taking away their dignity. Um, So if you have the opportunity to do that, then yeah, you have to do it. And that person might say, it's just a joke. Calm down. Why are you so sensitive? Exactly. But that's on them. That's on them to feel that way. Um, and that's probably what they're going to say. But that's a defense <laughs> so. mechanism. That's protecting um, their yeah. um, their way of thinking. They might even cry. Mm-hmm. They might even cry. Yeah. That, too, is manipulation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, yes. So going back to him. Um, yeah, he felt like uh, it kind of painted black people as so sensitive that you have to tiptoe around us when it comes to conversation about race or we will like, you know, um, you know discombobulate yeah we'll and he didn't fall apart he didn't particularly care for the jackie robinson analogy either um which i i think that's that analogy makes sense because that is the way it is and and everybody knows that uh, jackie robinson was um a quality uh player he wasn't given the opportunity to play because he because of his rights though and so i i don't know i don't think um him calling that a flaw um, makes sense to me. So um, that paragraph specifically, I'm just going to read it. He says, for one, D'Angelo's book is replete with claims that are either plain wrong or bizarrely disconnected from reality. Mm -hmm. Exactly who comes away from the saga of Jackie Robinson thinking he was the first black baseball player good enough to compete with whites. Imagine if instead the story D'Angelo writes when something like this, Jackie Robinson, the first black man whites allowed to play major league baseball. End quote. But no one need imagine the scenario as others have pointed out because it is something every baseball fan already knows. Later in the book, D'Angelo insinuates that when white women cry upon being called racist, black mm-hmm. people are reminded of white women crying as they lied about being raped by black men eons ago. But how would she know? Where is the evidence for this pre- presumptuous claim? Another one. End quote of the paragraph. Um, so I really felt like he... Um, in some cases were extreme. Mm-hmm. She can know yeah. because we've said it. Yeah. It's been <laughs> um, black said. people specifically have said every time you, you, you weaponize your tears, you remind us of the woman who lied about Emma Teal. Yeah. Um, 
and other examples. Yeah. Like we're not going to pretend like Emmett Till was the only right. um, child attacked or killed uh, because of white tears. Yeah. Um, so I'll say overall, um, I did see some points he was making, but even if he assumes, okay, so we can take just from that paragraph, he is assuming all baseball fans or real baseball fans know that Jackie Robinson um, wasn't just the best black baseball player who ever existed. How would he yeah. know? How would? How does he know that exactly that everyone knows that exactly? And and what about those that aren't baseball fans? This is you know if you're just learning history, you, you that's a good point. You don't yeah. know that, so we do need to hear that in that way. I think all of our efforts. Um, in regards to silencing people who are trying their best to be ethical and moral people could be better spent just being ethical and moral ourselves. Mm -hmm. So instead of um, spending all of this time talking about what Robin D'Angelo should or shouldn't do, perhaps we can um, think about what we can do as individuals to further um, be peaceable with as many people as possible um, and be fair in our actions. Yeah, I agree. Well, and mind our business. Somehow this is like minding my, when I was reading this book, I felt like, but this ain't none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> this is a white woman talking to white right. people. This ain't my business. Right. And so can we just <laughs> jump into that or do we need to take a break? Well, let's take a quick break. If you don't, I mind. don't mind, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so, Kari, what is your final verdict? Um, would you recommend this book? Um, while I understand the conversation specifically about how this book is the embodiment of white people benefiting from black pain and black death or a white person specifically benefiting and that that is wrong. I do get that. Um, but at the same time, I feel like this is another um you know, iron in the fire of anti-racism conversation. Um, and while this, it, it can be seductive for some to become obsessed with this type of conversation where all they want to talk about is race and how we can combat race. Um, I think the most important thing is to turn the light on ourselves and make sure, well, not make sure, but um, really um, dissect what in our heart is biased um, in an unfair way. We, we all have our biases. We, we all do. And when that bias is held up by a system that really costs people their lives, it is especially important for us to dissect. Well, what can I do to not allow myself to um, perpetuate this violence? It's violent. Racism is racism violent. Racism is violent. You can repeat that. Um, so. Yeah. So um, overall, I will say there are great black voices that you can um read um, that will give you a great um, look into the black experience and how racism affects everyday lives. Um, a few of those books that come to mind are The Warmth of Other Suns, um, you know, the autobiography of Malcolm X, if you really ready. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I would say that for some white fragility, because um, I think it's important to have a white voice in that mix. Mm -hmm. I do. Um uh, what about you? Would you recommend this book? What's your final verdict? Yeah, I actually would recommend it. And um, I, I can think of conversations that I've had with my daughter uh, in an effort to kind of explain some of these things. Um, this book set them all. It, you know, mm -hmm. it kind of set them all. And I, I, I think she might benefit from reading a, a piece of it and other white people as well, hearing it from um the voice of someone like them. Yeah. And if you're passing over stamp to reach for this book, that does feel like a problem to me because this book quotes stamp yeah. and it, and other books it references as it should. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that, but why not listen to um, stamp? Why not listen to those? <laughs> listen why not stamp. read stamped first? Why not listen to those people that are experiencing the results of this system mm -hmm, first? Mm -hmm. um, so I, that would be my, I idea. immediately yeah. made a recommendation after um, listening to um, um, reading Stamped that my family should read that. Here, you read this, you read this, you read this, because it was so, mm -hmm. to me, it has so much um, valuable information about the history of it all. And I appreciated that, but I'm not necessarily 
um, want to throw this book out there. Um, but right. I would, I would tell people, especially um, um, white people here, you know, this is, if you feel like you need to hear it coming from somebody like you, go ahead and read this book because it is, it did have informative information in it. And how many, uh, for how many years have women said, hey, this is the treatment we face in the workplace and this isn't cool. And those empowered to change it were like, women are so sensitive. Mm -hmm. And some women were like, women are so yes, sensitive. Yeah. But then a man comes forward and maybe writes, you know, catch and kill or right. some other uh, journalist comes forward and is like, this is going on, men. And then men are like, well, either I don't want to be outed as someone who perpetuates this behavior or, you know, I really didn't realize it was such a big problem until someone who looks like me said so. Right. I think it's important. And that's society. That's the way it yeah. is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. This has been a great look into, um, and just going back to Stamped real quick, mm -hmm. no matter where you are on the concentration scale, if you have the um, ability to sit down and concentrate on a book, read Stamped by Ibram X. Kendi. If you like in the middle like me, then read the YA version, mm -hmm. Stamped a Remix by um, Ibram X. Kendi and Jason Reynolds. And if you like really like a me on most days and your attention <laughs> span is the <laughs> same size as the goldfishes, then there is a children's book mm -hmm. coming in out. In May. Um, yeah, in mm -hmm. May, uh, Stamped also. I think it's already so thank you available for, for um, pre-purchase. Pre-order? Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Alexis, what are we reading next week? We are reading 1984 by Orson Welles. What's his name? Wow. <laughs> we are, <laughs> that is so wild because I get George Orwell and Orson Welles mixed up all the time. <laughs> oh, George Orwell. George Orwell. <laughs> wait, wait. Why did you say Orson Welles? I don't know. I don't know. Because one is like a movie writer and director and one isn't. Right. <laughs> Why do we do? You're not the first person. I don't know. I'm sorry. That just blew my mind <laughs> that you said that. <laughs> so, yeah, to be clear, 1984 by George Orwell. Yeah. And you know what? Go watch um, Citizen Kane. It's a great movie. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Let's Society is, um, I don't know. Hold on. <laughs> it's brought to you by us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you for listening to lit society we'll see you next thursday lit society is brought to you by alexa sonaria and kari herrera support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our five show stars. on apple Podcasts, along with the comment about why you absolutely love us we love y'all too do. if you <laughs> we do if you've enjoyed what you just heard tell a friend about lit society uh visit litsocietypod.com for show notes this month's book list and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter and i'll also add that just today I added a links page which has our episode recommendations along with a list of our most popular episodes and we also have a playlist on Spotify you guys hey. um, that you can just click on and listen to our favorite episodes and until next time readers read, read something, something.